On today's show, are the Thunder the favorites out west with the new Isaiah Hartenstein signing? We'll get Brandon Ribar's opinion of this matter. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. I am your host, media member, and SI Thunder beat writer, Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Joining me today is Daily Thunder beat writer, radio extraordinaire, at Brandon Rabar. You can find him literally everywhere talking uh, Thunder basketball. Brandon, thanks for coming back on. After the draft, we have a lot to discuss. Uh, you called your shot on... Uh, one pat platform as you kept shuffling the deck of your picks and you actually did talk a lot about Topich on this show so we're going to recap the draft uh coming up but initially the biggest news of the week the biggest news of the summer and some of the biggest news in thunder franchise history is convincing Isaiah Hartenstein in in a in a I would imagine uh muggy night in Eugene Oregon to come to Oklahoma City to to turn his back, so to say, on a contending New York team uh, with a significant pay raise, but also uh, with the with a move that makes the Thunder legitimate title contenders for the foreseeable future. What was your initial reaction whenever you just saw that the Thunder actually landed their biggest free agent signing in, in Thunder history? My first reaction is this is a difference maker. Like this is the dude. The Thunder obviously needed to get some size. And I think that we all thought that they were going to go out and get some size. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people were screaming, why aren't they getting size in the draft? I mean, this was the plan all along. So the initial news hits, I'm like, this is the best big that was available in the free agent market. And the Thunder went out and got him. And I know that Hartenstein loved it in New York. This is New York City. This is an East contender that just got Mikkel Bridges, so they're going to be even better. They were offering him as much as they could. And my thought was, if Sam Presti is flying to Eugene, Oregon, this man is going to steal the deal. I mean, we saw it with Mike Muscala uh, a few years ago, so now he's two for two. He is two for two. He is the, uh, an immaculate in-home recruiter, uh, something that maybe he can take advantage of in college football rankings uh, it, once he's done with the basketball world. But you mentioned that Hartenstein's a difference maker. I think that there's still a pocket um, of listeners who maybe look at like the raw box score and, and don't really grasp the full picture uh, because you know it, it's hard to follow 82 games of one team, uh, much less keep up with the Newark Knicks backup center who was thrusted into a starting role uh, due to injury. How do you see Hartenstein being a difference maker for the Thunder? Yeah, looking at just his raw box score, I don't think it tells the full story. One, because his minutes, you know, weren't as high because, you know, Mitchell Robinson was playing, then he was out and, you know, precious to chew. Like there is some things going on with, with the big minutes there in New York. But when he's on the court, when you look at all the advanced stats, like defensive EPM, like the dude is number two in that. Like, I mean, all the advanced stats love Hartenstein. It's because he does all the little things. Um, his defense is just so good. You know, the Thunder beat the Mavs when Chet Holmgren was on the court. It's when Chet was sitting that the Thunder lost to the Mavs in the playoffs. They needed paint protection when Chet was sitting. And Hartenstein provides that. He provides a real second guy that can protect the paint in a big way. He's a great rebounder. So he's got defense. He's got rebounding. He's got this little putt shot, this little push shot that is incredibly efficient. Like if the offense breaks down, just hand it to him in the paint and let him do his little push shot. And then the other thing is his screening, like J-Dub and Shea, like they weren't around, you know, Shea was with Steven Adams for one year. So he's going to recall those glory days of some, you know, hard hitting screens and the space that he got with those. J-Dub hasn't had anything like that yet. Like Hartenstein is a great screener. And then the other thing is his playmaking, his passing. We've seen that the Thunder have set a premium on playmaking from every position. And Hartenstein is truly one of the best passing bigs in the league. So it's it's all the little things combined. Like you can't just point to one thing and be like, that's it. He's like a jack of all trades. And usually when you hear jack of all trades, it's like, okay, he's decent at a lot of things. I don't think he's just decent 
at a lot of things. I think he's really good at a lot of things. Yeah, I, I think that the two biggest acronyms in Oklahoma right now are uh, BOB, Brahms Bag of Burgers, and Defensive EPM. Uh, there, there's been a ton of EPM talk ever since uh, the signing of Isaiah Hartenstein, but his passing is elite for position. I really like his physicality on the glass and also in the paint uh, defensively. And you mentioned the, the screen setting, his ability to, to move my free up driving lanes for a team that was already drive heavy and already uh, did their damage inside. That's massive. 61% on floaters and runners uh, this season just kind of illustrates how good he is at those push shots uh, as kind of a safety valve when plays break down. Uh, and he has the ability to make you pay whenever defenses break down because of his passing, because of that push shot, where, as you mentioned, if you get a bit chaotic and you need to have a hot potato of the basketball to the big man type of scenario, that's great. If the defenses get out of position rotating around, he can fire it to the corner, and you've kind of elevated all the positions around him as well to where now you're firing the ball to some really good shooters uh, on the perimeter for a team that was already top in the NBA in three-point percentage. So I, I think that whenever you look at this move in the scope of what it does uh, for, for the roster, uh, it just gives them – more versatility for a team that already was relying on being versatile. Uh, you now can play, you know, a massive lineup. You, you also can play, uh, you know, the best small ball. You also just simply uh, put, have the ability to pass the baton to another rim protector, which is what they did not have against Dallas uh, and what kind of ultimately doomed them uh, down the stretch of last year. It was a, it was a scenario where, you, you know, you, you lost to the eventual Western conference champs in six games, but it has a zero point differential to kind of show uh Despite everything that went wrong, like despite you couldn't play Giddy, despite that you didn't have uh, the backup big, like you were still right there, um, you know, with with Jadub not not playing up the performance that, that you would expect, like with everything that went wrong, uh, you, you've really uh, mitigated some of those things in the off season already, and I think that you've positioned yourself really well if you're Oklahoma City uh, to take yet another jump, and it feels like they they should be out of jumps by now after two straight fifteen plus win improvements, and, and in all likelihood, uh, the, the jump won't necessarily be in the win column. The jump will be kind of just the eye test and the production level and things of that nature. But this move seriously makes them a lot better. Uh, how do you think it looks functionally in terms of the starting five, where you're at with the contract, like that kind of stuff? Yeah, so the contract, first of all, you know, we know that it's front-loaded and we know that the third year is non-guaranteed. And I think those... Both these terms are good for the Thunder and for Hartenstein. You know, Hartenstein gets his bag. He's earned it. And he's getting a big, big pay raise. And he's getting much more than the, than the Knicks could have got. And they tried. I mean, like they could have given him like four years, $72 million and some change. Uh, some change is like hundreds of thousands of dollars in this case. Uh, but $72 million. But the Thunder kind of blew that out of the water. But the cap is still clean for the Thunder in that third year when like Dub and Chet are due for a pay raise. That cap is still clean, but they'll have options that year. You know, they could still keep him. They could decline it. They could trade him like they could extend him. So many different things they can do with that non-guaranteed third deal if it's a team option. And, you know, I think that the Thunder played this the right way. They do this. They re-sign and extend Wiggins and Isaiah Joe. They took care of business with the big fish, with Hartenstein, what they needed, and then took care of key role players for the long term. As far as the starting five goes, this is still a mystery box to me. I mean, we know for a fact it's going to be Shea Gilgis Alexander, Lou Dort, Jalen Williams, and Chet Holmgren. That fifth spot, is it going to be Isaiah Hartenstein and they play two bigs together? Uh, I think in any case, Chet Holmgren is going to be the primary five. Um, do they go smaller and start Alex Caruso and bring Hartenstein off the bench? That's the way I'm leaning right now. I think it'll be Caruso. Or maybe there's a wild card. Maybe it's Dylan Jones, for instance. Dylan Jones. I, I don't think it's going to be his, Dylan Jones. His I'm just saying. should just be wild card. Right. Yeah. That wild card gets said, uh, it's just about Dylan Jones. Yes, absolutely. Uh, or maybe it's matchup dependent. Maybe they don't, you know, commit to one guy and they play it game by game. Um, mm -hmm. But we need to get that wild card started. I kind of like that. It really does fit him. Um, so if, if I were to bet right now, I would think Alex Caruso is the, the primary usual starter and Hartenstein comes off the bench. But I do think Hartenstein is going to play a lot of minutes, 25 plus each night. 
Um, and I think that there are going to be, you know, 10 to 12 minutes per night where he and Chet play together, whether that means they start together, he comes off the bench, they play some minutes, maybe they close together, but Hartenstein's going to have a big, big role. Yeah, they will play more than 2% of their minutes uh, with two bigs on the floor, unlike in the past season. Will that happen in the starting five? I'm also uh, skeptical of that. I think that like they won't be as rigid as they were previously. We're like, these are our five guys. If they're healthy, they're starting. I think that it could be more dependent on on flow and, and, and feel of the, the point of the season and also of matchup. Uh, but I think that ultimately the starting five will typically be you know Caruso in place of Giddy. I, I think that these moves, you know, when you look at them in the scope of the actual roster and not so much as evaluating how good is Hartenstein as an individual, how good is Caruso as an individual, then the moves look even better. If that's even possible, because these moves have gotten a resounding A plus grade from everyone. We'll talk about that coming up as well as has the perception of the Thunder in free agency changed at all after Monday. But first, let's see right now. Better friends over at Game Time. Check out Game Time today to get started. Game Time's great. It's the best place to buy MLB tickets and, and tickets for anything, really, from theater to comedy shows. Uh, whatever you need, they have it for you, including on concerts this summer. So they get the last-minute deals, lowest prices guaranteed. Save up to 60% off buying last-minute tickets uh, at Game Time. I love Game Time's all-in pricing. You can just see everything right up front. There's no surprise fees at checkout. You know what you're getting into. I also love the view from your seat. So you can see the angles on the sight lines and what you're getting into. Uh, if you've never been to that venue before, that's really, really helpful. So go download the GameTime app, create your account today. Use code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. That's terms and conditions applying. Again, create your account. Redeem code LOCKEDONNBA, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A, for $20 off your first purchase. Go there right now to Game Time. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Brandon, does the signing of Isaiah Hartenstein change the look of the Thunder's free agency at all? And I and I don't think we'll have this answer for many years to come because they now are in a position where um, you know th their moves from here on out are really internal. It's it's retaining. Chet and JW and Shea. Uh, it's it's making moves via trade necessarily more so than, than free agency. But you know, I think that the days of like thinking that the Thunder can only get a Patrick Patterson, Mike Muscala are gone. Are, are they gonna bring in the number one free agent in any class? Probably not. But like I think that they have elevated themselves both reputationally as an organization, the city as a city, everything is kind of elevated to where they can start to be more players than they were before while also not getting like crazy. No, I think you're exactly right. And I think that it's a few things that play into this. I think that the reputation of the organization, Sam Presti has taken care of each player that's come through here, whether it be Chris Paul, Al Horford, these vets, even guys like, you know, G League guys, two way guys. He gets all, all these guys into positions that will be best for them. And, you know, players and agents, importantly, remember those things and you build those relationships and you build that reputation. And the Thunder have built that reputation, not only with players and agents, but just like, you know, being a first class organization, being a winning organization and being a place where players can thrive. And then you see this team led by Shea and Jada and Chet and how they're on the rise and how much fun they're having together and the chemistry and they're barking after post game and everybody's talking about how this is kind of the young team of the future and how this could be a team that wins some titles. So I think all these things are into play. I agree that the city is getting bigger and the reputation with the city is getting better. Also the fact, you know, as far as Hartenstein goes in the past with the Katie Russ Harden teams, they didn't really have a surplus of money. Uh, this was kind of the first time they had a big amount of money plus a young winning team to go fill a spot. So, you know, it's, I think it's a good thing that, you know, the first time they go out and try to get a coveted, highly recruited free agent that they land him. Um, but, but I do think, you know, famously they didn't get, you know, the one recruited guy that, you know, Katie and Russ tried to get was Pau Gasol. We still don't have any opera houses here, but you know, maybe like maps seven or eight, may, maps nine, we'll get take care of those opera houses and yeah, and, and, and we volunteered to be the first uh, act at the opera house. <laughs> Me? Me and you, yeah. 
Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I'll, the opera. I'll, I'll let you take lead. I will back you up. Um, but yeah, I, I think I've heard you sing. You could do it. Um, you know, if if there's any opera that like has a rap in the middle, I'm your guy. Um, but but I do think though that this was big for the Thunder, and it's big. You know, every everybody sees this. Everybody sees Hartenstein was wanted by the New York Knicks, a place where he was comfortable, a place where he was winning, a place where he probably has a starting role and has a lot of money, and he walks away from that to go to OKC. Yeah, they gave him a lot of money, obviously. That's But but still, it was a place where he wanted to be, and he made that decision. And there were other teams that were recruiting him. So I, I think this is a big win for the Thunder to land Hartenstein. So what do you make of this roster in general? Like, like is there anything uh, that you see right now that they're really going to struggle with or that they're really going to thrive in? Like, just what's your overall temperature check on this roster? It's a really, really good roster. And it's it's really deep. Um, but to be a, a successful team, you need two things. You need, like, top-end talent. And the Thunder have that. They have a guy that finished in top five in MVP voting two straight years, and he's still 25 years old. They have J Dub and Chet, two emerging all stars. And then you got to have good depth, and the Thunder have really good depth when you're when your fourth, fifth, and sixth best players are Alex Caruso, Lou Dort, and Isaiah Hartenstein. Like that mid-tier depth is really good. And then their deep depth is really good. You need that deep depth. And um, you have that. With Isaiah Joe, Kaysen Wallace, and Aaron Wiggins, um, I think that they're really diverse. I think that they'll have a lot of options and flexibility when it comes to lineups. Having Hartenstein and Caruso, I think, are game changers because it's two more two-way players. The Thunder are stocking up on two-way players. Every single one of these guys can play offensively and defensively. And I mean, even Isaiah Joe, like, you know, he's a three-point specialist in theory. But the dude takes charges, he competes, he works hard. Um, so he's he's not like a, a bad defender like you would normally think of like a three-point specialist. And you look at his size. So that's just kind of the culture. Uh, you know, in the past, you, you had like a guy like Andre Robertson, elite defensive player, but, you know, couldn't shoot, obviously. And then you have like three-point specialists like Amo or Alex Sabrinas or whatever, but, you know, they can't play defensively. We saw with Ennis Cantor, the whole Billy Donovan can't play Cantor. Like when they get to the playoffs, they want guys that can play two ways. They want diverse guys, and that's what they're building. Yeah, and I think that when you look at this roster of like how it fits together, uh, they have a championship level core right now, right this second, uh, top to bottom. Like they have a chance, they have the ingredients for a championship. The biggest question that I have for this roster is just, when is Jadab and Chet going to be ready? Because if Jadab and Chet are ready to be like playoff risers, playoff just immaculate players, then this team's going to win a championship. Like, like this team is that good. They should be the favorite to win the West. They should be the favorite to go toe to toe with anybody, uh, including Boston. Like, and, and Boston's a formidable team, and then they've lost nobody, and they're going to be the favorites to win the title for for a long time. Uh, but the Thunder are right there if those two guys take a step forward. And what I think that is so good about the offseason for the Thunder is that they've made this roster so that at any moment, whether it's this season, next season, the season after that, they are prepared for whenever that jump does happen. They're gambling on that jump happening. I think it's a really good bet. I think that it's a it's a bet worth taking because these two guys have shown every indication of being guys who can raise their game. And I look at what this roster's done for Chet Holmgren, and I think that your first instinct – might be to go to like, well, he doesn't have to play the center now. I think that that's the complete wrong way to look at it. I think it's just gone to an area where one, as you mentioned, pulling him off the floor uh, in, in that Maverick series for small, you know, for those spells in that Maverick series is no longer dooming the Thunder and no longer dooming the team. That's really good. But two, you look at how teams defended the Thunder, and a lot of people will look at how they ignored Josh Giddy and pinned it on Josh Giddy. It had a lot to do with Chet Holmgren as well, of like cross matching to where you can hide your center away from Chet because you understand your center cannot guard Chet straight up uh, on an island. Well, now you're cross matching off of either Caruso or Dort, uh, and likely of those two guys, you're going to pick Dort. Uh, but Dort has shown you that with the volume of threes that you'd expect him to get in that scenario, he's able to knock them down more consistently. 
And, and if they leave Caruso, certainly he will get them out of it. And so the Thunder are just more prepared now to either um, – you know, capitalize on you cross matching or get you out of a cross match. And if you do that, if you come out of your cross match, the way that they can just completely exploit you with chat on an island with a center, or even a smaller guy on them, if he gets more comfortable shooting over small guys, uh, it, it just opens up so many things that I think that that before you even talk about any sort of skill leap from Chet Holmgren, a comfortability leap from him uh, will just do wonders for the production and for how good this team uh, can be. So when you look at it, from like the moving parts of just how they how they work together and not necessarily what Caruso's points per game or what Isaiah Hartenstein's points per game were. Uh, once you put them together with the in-house you know production we've already seen, uh, I, I think that it gets you even more interested in how good this team can be. Yeah, and and this team defensively <laughs> has the potential to be really special. And, you know, usually when teams are this good defensively, when you have a guy in Caruso who's been, you know, second team all defense and first team all defense back to back, you have Hartenstein. We, we talked about him being second in defensive EPM. You have Chet Holmgren, Shea Gilgis Alexander, and Lou Dort, who are all in top 15 of all defensive voting. Then you have Kaysen Wallace, an up and coming defender. J Dub, really an underrated defender. You have all these guys. And, and if you're wondering, like, you know, okay, well, who plays the four? Who play? you know, is that too many guards? You know, Sam Presti talked about how Alex Caruso, you know, can guard Kevin Durant. He can play against Paul George. He can guard up. And so, you know, when you're looking at, like, who's the four? Who takes this guy? Who takes that guy? The Thunder can just throw all these defensive guys at you, but they still don't suffer offensively because they have an elite score and this guy that has all this gravity and SGA – and then he's surrounded by shooters. They have a, a great secondary scorer in j -Dub. And like you said, if he takes that next leap, which I think we all expect him to, that all-star type leap, that sends this team into another level. You have a big in Chet who can shoot from three and space the floor. You have Alex Caruso. Everybody talks about his defense, but the man shot 41% from three on five attempts per game. Lou Dort uh, shot nearly 40% from three last season on high volume. So the Thunder... And, and it's very similar, you know, to the Celtics. It was like, you know, they're just smothering teams defensively. And you would think you get a break on the other end, at least. Like, if they're going to smother you defensively, you think you maybe be able to take advantage of, like, target somebody. You can't target anybody on the Thunder anymore. Like, who are you going to target? Um, so, no, I, I think that the way this roster has been constructed and adding Caruso and Hartenstein, it's just hard to find holes. And if you if you pinpointed one spot, you would say like, okay, they don't have a true four. Like they have two great centers, Hartenstein and Chet Hunger. But like we said, they've got dudes that can play up and down the lineup, so they don't need that right now. I, I just you know maybe yeah. in the future, maybe they go out and get a four. But but the way this roster is constructed, they're so diverse. Yeah, I, I look in this team can be a historically great defensive team. That's not like a a hot take or anything, just the amount of bodies that they can throw at you that are very effective defensively um, are awesome. I think that Chet will look awesome whenever he plays next to Hartenstein uh, in spurts. I think that majority uh, of the time, you're going to want to stagger those minutes. So that way you cover all 48 minutes within uh, a rim protection you know, guy in the paint. But at times you will play both of them together and those minutes will look awesome. And then like you mentioned with Caruso of, of yeah, like when you spit it out, rat -a tat tat Shea, Caruso, Dub, you know, Chet Hartenstein, that, that doesn't sound like as jumbo as, as it actually is functionally of like Caruso can, can handle bigger bodies. You saw what, what Jadab can do scaling up and, and, and really, you know, defending Kyrie really well against Dallas. And also you saw what he done against power, you know, against power forwards throughout the season as well. So how versatile this team is defensively is really encouraging. And then, you know, the same thing can be said for Jadab that can be said for Chet of like, what went wrong for Jadab in the playoffs? was he was excellent defensively. Like you, you could not have asked for, for better defense on Kyrie Irving to limit him. And Kyrie admitted as such, like this was the toughest matchup he's ever had because of how athletic the Thunder were, of like not letting him uh, you know, get to his spots and get comfortable. Offensively is where he kind of you know shrunk a bit, if you want to put it that way. But guess whose life gets really easy, as we've mentioned before, with this addition? And, and it doesn't show up in the box score, but he is second in screen assists. Like it's as a hurt sign of, of a guy who can uh, pave the way 
for Jadab to get going. And, and what's always said about scores is that you, if you get a couple easy baskets early, it can change your entire game. And so who knows if you would have gotten a couple easy baskets for Jadab in those staggered lineups against Dallas, maybe instead of having a couple clunkers, he has a couple fantastic games. And in a, in a series with a zero point differential that can swing you to the Western conference finals. And then you roll the ball out there and see what happens next. So like what, I, what I'm getting at here is that like, yes, you had a basketball reference, like the, the, Points, rebounds, and assists column might not be something that jumps out to you, but when you have you talk through how they are going to use these pieces, then you really see why I think that they are the favorites in the West. We're going to see if Brandon agrees that the Thunder are the favorites in the West coming up. Uh, plus, uh, ask about the draft. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network. Your teams every day, Brandon. You have laid out how good this roster is and how good they can be defensively. Are you willing to officially say, having seen Detroit lose KCP, I mean, sorry, Denver losing KCP, uh, Detroit's a non-factor, uh, having seen Dallas make some interesting moves where they shuffle out DJJ, but bring in Najee Marshall and, and Clay Thompson to fill in for DJ, DJJ and Josh Green. Are you willing to say that the Thunder are the favorites in the very, very tough Western Conference? I am ready, Ryland, to say that. They, this was the number one seed in the Western Conference last year, and they, without a doubt, got better. I mean, they they flip Josh Giddy, who I still believe is going to be a good player but didn't fit with this team. Uh, they flip him for Alex Caruso and Isaiah Hartenstein. They've obviously gotten better. The internal development, when when most of your team is so young, we can expect J-Dub, Chet, Case and Wallace, these guys to get even better. And then, like you said, like, I, you know, all of last year, Denver was the favorites for good reason. They just come off a championship, but this is two straight years where they've lost a very key player from, from Bruce Brown and now KCP and KCP, his defense and his three point shooting is vital to that team. And this is a team that depended on their starters to win games. They were already like we talked about the Thunder's depth. Denver's depth is it's hurting really, really bad when you lose KCP. Uh, like their bench, they've basically got four really good players, and then a bunch of question marks after that. Like you said, the Mavs was it a lateral move? You know, they probably improve a little bit. Their defense probably gets a little bit worse. Their offense gets a little bit better. Um, you know, maybe Derek Lively, I think we can expect him to get better. Um, Luca may be healthier. So the mass probably a little bit better. The Wolves, they get Rob Dillingham, really good player, but he's still a rookie. He's probably going to be a bench point guard. There's some question marks about his defense. I think that's still the big four in the West. I think it's mm -hmm. OKC, Mavs, Mini, and Denver. And that's how I would rank them right now. But I would absolutely have OKC on the top. They made huge changes to get better. And the other teams either stayed the same, got slightly better or got worse. Yeah. I, I see it the same way of, of OKC being number one. I think that Dallas, you know, what they're banking on is that like in the aggregate of like, you spit out Tim Hardaway, Jr. Josh Green and DJJ, and you bring in Quentin Grimes and you bring in Clay Thompson and you bring in Najee Marshall at a minimum, you stay the same defensively. You can argue you got better defensively because of what Quentin Grimes is when he's healthy because of the idea of what Najee Marshall can do defensively. And then you're just rolling the dice on like, hey, those guys' job gets a heck of a lot easier playing next to Luka Doncic. Like go look at what DJJ was offensively before he got uh, with Luka. And so um, it, it's, it's a gamble that's worth taking, I think, because I don't think that you got worse at all if you're Dallas defensively and then offensively there, there's a sizable sample now of like guys like Luca, just making guys better, making guys uh, who are capable of hitting open shots. Like we know what those guys can do when they're open. Uh, so it's a good gamble for them. Uh, Detroit, I mean, I don't want to keep calling them Detroit, but Denver, uh, you know, they, they are uh, interesting. Cause like, you just feel like Jokic is a Mahomes in type player where like right. you can just put anyone around him and he's going to make them the, the, the one or two seed in the West. Uh, the, the team that I find interesting in the West is, uh, is, Memphis, and I don't know how good they're going to be, but I, I could see them being a team for the Thunder specifically. That, regardless of record, whether they're the top two seed or they're a, or they're a five seed or they're a ten seed, whatever they are, that they could be a team that stylistically uh, matches up with OKC very well. Of um, you look at 
Zach Eady, who neither one of us were like a huge fan of pre-draft, but in that specific environment, I like Zach Eady getting to play drop coverage primarily uh, with Jaron Jackson Jr. roaming, with Desmond Bain taking on the perimeter assignment of your top guy like a Shea. The ability to score inside the arc is going to be very tough. That's where the Thunder make a lot of their bread and butter is inside the arc. So how do you manage to keep pace with that? Uh, and then you, you look offensively at what they can do with Ja and, and how he's played off of Steven Adams before. And you, you can use Edie in that Adams role next to uh, Jaron Jackson Jr., Des Desmond Bain. I think that uh, Memphis could take a, a step forward in the West this year, especially if healthy. Uh, and I think that they could be a team that, regardless of record, uh, Thunder fans do not like playing them this season because of how they match up with OKC. And, and most of the time, that's what things come down to in the postseason is matchups. I'd still lean the Thunder as the favorites, obviously. I'm picking the Thunder uh, to win the West. So, uh, spoiler alert for uh, October's preview shows, but uh, the Thunder will in the West this year. I think that they've done uh, enough to do that, you know, with their roster, with their you know head coach, with their star players, uh, and and projecting the leap forward from from J Dub and Chet. Now they've also made some moves we haven't talked about yet, and that's the NBA draft where they did take Topic, who you kept warning everyone about uh, uh, before the draft uh, about a guy who can provide value. Now that that's come to fruition, uh, what do you make of now the idea of redshirting Topic as he's hurt this year with a torn ACL, but being covered by like the additions of Caruso and and Hartenstein and things like that. Yeah, I think I think it was the move. I think when Topic falls to you at twelve, you run that card in and draft him. The value is too good. This was considered a weak draft, and there was only a few guys that were considered kind of star talents. And that's not to say that Topic will be a star. But he's one of only a handful of guys that, you know, most most analysts, most draft gurus said, hey, this guy could be a star when he's there at 12. You, you got to take him like he's he's a playmaker. He was the best playmaker in this draft. He's got a great first step. He finishes at the rim so well. Um, there's so much potential. He's got the size that the Thunder love like they love the big jumbo playmakers. And I know that there was a lot of comparisons to Giddy. Um, but I think the difference is I do think that he has a higher potential to, to become a better shooter. Uh, when you look at his free throw numbers and you look at his three point volume uh, and then you look at the kind of shots he was taking and then that first step and his finishing at the rim, I think is a real difference maker as well. So I, I think it was a great move. And because you go out and get Caruso and because you have Hartenstein, you don't have to depend on a rookie. If they went out and got a big, if they reach for a big, if they reach for, you know, a, a wing, maybe, you know, those guys probably weren't going to make a difference on this team anyway. So regardless of who they chose, um, I, I don't think that those guys were going to bump, you know, obviously Caruso or, or even Isaiah Joe or Aaron Wiggins, um, Casey Wallace out of the rotation. So take the best player available, take the high talent, the biggest upside you get a dude that was projected top three or four. This dude, everybody thought before his injury, the Spurs were going to take him and the big pairing was going to be Wimby and Topic. Topic was going to be his point guard of the future. Like at number four, when that dude falls to 12 and you have a loaded roster, you got to take him. Yeah. And I think that if there's any team prepared for either scenario, like prepared to foster his development and prepared for him to be a really uh, high end player and a top five player in a draft. Uh, it's the thunder. And if there's any team prepared for like, Hey, we took a shot at 12. It didn't really work out, you know, it, it, and, and we need to find a way to pivot. It's the thunder. Like they, they have all their bases covered in this specific example. Now they weren't done though. They went into the draft with just one pick, but they came out with two more uh, Dylan Jones. They traded up for to go get at 26. Uh, you and I were in thunder eye on when that happened. Uh, what, what is your what is your take on Dylan Jones now uh, watching him over the weekend? My take is he his selection on Ryland's all juice team was was deserved and very worthy. Um, he is such a fun player to watch. Like you don't usually see these dudes like a, a six, six dude like him, six, five, six, six built like he is. Like he's like a bowling ball, but he's such a great playmaker. He's a he's a scorer. Um, he's a great rebounder. That 6'11 wingspan. He plays hard. He plays smart. You know, he checks all the thunder boxes. Like after doing the deep dive and watching like hours of film on him and, and watching interviews and all those things, he checks the boxes for the thunder, like physically, like his physical profile with the plus wingspan and, and the size, but then he checks the boxes, like as far as toughness, 
high IQ character. And then the playmaking, I go back to the playmaking, like the thunder, you know, Sam Presti said in his exit interview, the Mavs passing, you know, that was the factor in the playoffs. That's, that's what made them so good. So he goes out and he gets Topic, the best passer. He gets Dylan Jones, who's a great passer. He gets AJ Mitchell, who is a great passer. And they also go out and get Hartenstein, one of the best passing bigs in, in the NBA. So Dylan Jones, uh, whereas I knew a little about him before the draft, but not a whole lot, um, I completely get why they traded five picks to go out and get him. And, and again, you get another first round pick and you didn't have to use a first round pick. The Thunder have used zero of their stock of first round picks and they get Caruso Hartenstein and another first round pick in this off season. Yeah. I mean, th th this was a really good, you know, off season for the thunder. I, I don't think that anyone can give them lower than an A on their off season grades. Whenever those things come due uh, here in the dog days of August, as we wait for the uh, Olympics to really heat up, but uh, AJ Mitchell, I, I think is going to project to be on a two way contract. I think he's an electrifying score, you know, a three level guy who can pass and also score on the ball which can be a huge boost to this Thunder team. Do you have any, uh, any AJ Mitchell thoughts for us? No, I did know, you know, I did know more about AJ Mitchell going into the draft than I did Dylan Jones. Uh, Cause his numbers stuck out to me. So I kind of did a deep dive on him and yeah, like his scoring, his shooting. Uh, and again, the playmaking and again, the jumbo size, like, you know, like a, a lead guard with plus size uh, that likes to pass first. And, and he has a high IQ again, like, the Thunder have a type, uh, and and I think AJ Mitchell fits that type. And and to to get him by trading away Lindy Waters, and obviously Lindy Waters for good reason, like fan favorite, born and bred Oklahoma, played all those basketball hoops here. But I think the Thunder did him a solid by take giving him to a spot, trading him to a spot where he's going to stay in the rotation, uh, if not the rotation, he's going to stay on the roster. Um, but you trade him for a younger guy with some upside and AJ Mitchell that you can put on the two way, which opened up the roster. I think it was a, a really savvy move. And then just using cash the rest of the way to move up for, to 38, to get him like they traded Lindy for the second rounder and just like gave a couple teams some cash and boom, you got AJ Mitchell. I think one of the more underrated prospects in the draft. It's really exciting stuff all throughout it. Thank you again, Brandon, for joining us now sitting right now. July 3rd, 2024, the year of our Lord. Uh, are the Thunder going to win the West? Are we going to go cover the NBA Finals? Oh, man. Put me on the spot early, Rylan. The good thing is nobody remembers this. If it's Yeah, that's true. That's Unless true. it's right. If it's right, we're going to clip it out. and A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Just like I did on you know on my Topic text on the ones where I said Topic. Um, and the good thing is for you that we're going to have a preview show in October where you can just walk anything back that you want. Nice. Yes, I will say, I think they are ready to take that step. I think they were close this year and that was with no playoff experience. Now they have the playoff experience. Now that they've improved the roster, they shorn up their weaknesses, internal development. Yes. There it is. Thunder Western Conference Finals winners. According to Brennan Bar. you can find them at Daily Thunder. You can find them on 107.7 The Franchise and The Ref Radio as well. Brandon, thanks again. I let them know what you're, what you're cooking up. Yeah, you can find me at Brandon Rabar on Twitter. You can uh, find me at Daily Thunder and then, like Ryan said, on the radio. So, Rylan, as always, thank you for having me, my man. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming on. And until next time, be good and be good to one.